Hello, everybody, and welcome to Good Stuff. My name is Kevin Billy, and uh, really excited today to to have a uh, a coaching icon, if you will, and and, and uh, somebody that I'm fortunate to call a friend, Larry Shiat. Coach, welcome to the uh, show. Glad to be here. We're all hunkered down, so this will be a good time. Yeah, well, I know a lot of people uh, know about you in general, and especially in this area with you being from Cleveland, but kind of give us a snapshot, if you will, of, of your career. I know that that might take the whole show in, in itself, but just give us a little bit of an idea, uh, you know, where you've been and what you're doing now. Well, uh, let's start with uh, Cleveland Heights High School. Uh, my, my best friend uh, and my mentor, Jim Capaletti, uh, started with him at Cleveland Heights High School, uh, met my bride at Worcester, and we've been married 45 years this June, so she could win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, we, we, we moved around quite a bit. Uh, six years at Cleveland State, six years at New Mexico, six years at Providence, and then three at Clemson. So 24 years as a, a proud and happy assistant. And then I got my first head job in 97 at the University of Wyoming. A year there, hit it lucky. Uh, five years at Clemson as head coach, uh, seven years with Billy Donovan as assistant coach, and then I ended my college career going back, the only coach ever to go back to the University of Wyoming for five years. Um, thought that was the end, got a co phone call from Rick Carlisle of the Mavs uh, when I stepped away from Wyoming and had three really wonderful years in the NBA with the Dallas Mavericks. Here I sit in South Carolina with Pam, and uh, I can't lie to you, I really miss the college game. Yeah, how, how's things going, I guess, as we'll tap into that here in a second. How things going with you and Pam with no coaching, no grandkids, all that? How, how's things for you guys right now? Well, you know, she gets tired of me. It, early <laughs> in the day, normally ask the question, what game are you going to? Mm. Uh, but no, seriously, it's been time that we never had in the past like many coaches, I was a workaholic, probably uh, not to the benefit of my family, but she did a great job. Uh, and, you know, as wonderful and as generous as Coach Carlisle and uh, uh, Mark Cuban was, that didn't fit us. Uh, if you've been the wife of a college coach, you have the kids over three days a week, you bring the dog to practice, you get on the charter plane with Papa Shy, and there's a place. As a wife of a pro coach, you're literally only a season ticket holder. And that just didn't work for us. I did not think it was fair. So here we sit in South Carolina, and uh, we'll see what's next. Yeah, so one of the most obvious questions right off the bat is, what, what are those differences? I mean, you spent the majority of your career, as you just said, in, in college. What, what do you see as the glaring differences between the two levels? And, and just how that might resonate with the viewers in terms of, you know, the professionalism or, you know, how they go about their days. The glaring difference beyond the game is that um, I thought you had a tremendous impact on young people throughout the rest of their lives, both on and off the court in the college game. You're teaching time management, how to deal with young ladies, uh, punctuality, uh, giving back. And so these are things that they would inherently have the rest of their lives. Whereas in the NBA, and they want the best, you know, because the better you make them, the more profitable they become. But these are these are men who are fathers, husbands, all millionaires or multimillionaires. So I did not think that that it was as good for us in the absence of affecting them off the court. Well, you, you threw me a, a nice softball toss there because one of the next things I was going to transition to in asking you is just knowing you as a person now for almost 15 years of my life. I, I think I think you're extremely great at giving back and pouring into people, which is, which is, a you know, an unbelievable trait as a leader. Is that something that just comes natural to you, you know, or are you just focused at that? I was always a wee guy. Uh, I think I was taught by coach Capaletti first, uh, you know, uh, I was a swimmer in, in my younger days, sixth, seventh grade. And he talked me into basketball and he said, look, there's five people and we're all going to give a little bit. And, and, you know, just more or less um, something bigger than self. And so, as I said, I was an assistant college coach and a happy and proud one for 24 years until I got my first head job 
And I think that probably is the substance that kept me alive. And, and that's why I think I missed the college game even more so than I did appreciate the NBA. And, and I, I will tell you this, they are the greatest offensive players in the world. Yeah, I'm sure. Another thing I just want to hit on that I find so impressive about you, Coach, is, is your ability to be present. Like when, when I'm with you or I'm on the phone with you or whatever, you're locked into me, you know, which makes me feel really, really important. And, and I think that's another thing to speak to people on that are in leadership positions, whether that's at home, a business, or running a team. Um, you know, this isn't normal for everyone, but it's important. What, what would you say to that uh, being one of your greater strengths, in my opinion? Well, first of all, if my wife and my three boys were here, they would probably argue <laughs> because my mind was always wandering, unfortunately, when I should have been focused on them. But I will say this, as a leader, as somebody who's in charge and can affect a great deal of people, I think the most important thing is listening and caring and having empathy. We're hearing that over and over again politically now, how important it is to give back. Um, <clears throat> how important it is to worry about somebody else and something greater than self. And you know what? You're right. It's not easy, but leading's not easy many times. Yeah, that's good stuff for sure. What do you think is the biggest factor that's helped you, maybe individually, your staff, the teams that you've been on? Like, what, what's, what is that factor in making, you know, those organizations so successful? Do you, do you see something that I'm always interested in hearing what separates? I thought maybe it was spending as much time in terms of having balance in the game of life as well as basketball. In the old days, <clears throat> a coach was supposed to be a teacher and a mentor um, <clears throat> and enjoying both. When we got into coaching, actually, you had a choice when I graduated Worcester up. You can be a high school coach or a college coach. If you're a high school coach, you're going to make about the same, but you're going to have your summers off and you're going to have a great retirement, which when you're 20 years old, who the hell cares about yeah. retirement? But as a college coach, you would not have those summers off. You would have to recruit, but you wouldn't have to teach. The common denominator was <clears throat> you would mentor, you would teach, and hopefully you would want to serve as a role model. And, you know, it's different now. Once TV got um, involved, once shoe companies got involved, the socialization and, and, and the amateurism, so to speak, escape. It's big business. It's a multi-billion dollar business. So therefore, the young people coming into the profession now, rightfully so, have a lot on their minds. It's like, if I hit it, I could be pretty rich. Yeah. That was never on our minds 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, back to the days of five star and all those things probably, right? <clears throat> um, I, I'm anxious then to know one thing that I talk to a lot of people at, to me, sustainability is one of the most difficult things in anything that we're doing, you know? What, what do you see as maybe some of that secret sauce to, to sustain success? Well, first of all, you surround yourself with good people. And when, when we say good people, not yes men, uh, when the doors are closed, arguing sometimes is very healthy. Different opinions, very healthy. I was lucky to work for Ray Derringer, Gary Colson, Rick Barnes, Billy Donovan, Rick Carlisle. All of them implored us to give more, to ask more to suggest more so that we have more things on the table. And I think as a leader, you have to be a good listener. Yeah, that's really good. I, I know just in my personal experience, you, you, yeah, you've been with a lot of good people, but I was fortunate to come down there and kind of stay at the house, go to camps and, and be, go over to Indianapolis with, with Coach Babb and all that with you guys. That staff with Anthony and Donnie and you and Billy is, is just remarkable. What was it that just made it click, that made it work? Is those some of the things that you just alluded to or, is, or was there something, you know, something else that separated that group? No, there was something very special about that group. And, and realistically, it's not that hard to conquer. We all cared more about Florida. We understood we don't work for Billy Donovan. We serve Florida. And anything we can do for the young people at Florida, 
or the university or the people surrounding the university, that's the most important thing. And I'll tell you one quick story. You know, I, I was out of a job. I was fired at Clemson as the head coach when I was asked to join Billy. And I, I hesitated a little bit because uh, Billy um, was winning 20 plus games a year. They just hadn't advanced as far as they wanted at that point. And I said, coach, I'm a little scared that I'll mess things up. You win 20 plus <laughs> games every year. And he said, just come down. We need somebody with your experience. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come down. If Anthony Grant and Donnie Jones feel good about me, I'll take the job for a dollar less than you're paying them because that's to me embodies what goes into winning and championship leadership. People who want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, what, what a run and what a good time. And I think the other thing with successful people, and you've probably seen this, whether it's been players or coaches, are their their daily routine and the habits. You know, what are some of these habits that these people have that maybe, you know, the average person who's not getting the same results don't have? Well, sometimes, you know, I don't want to go into detail on um, some other people. I, I will tell you that the one glaring strength that I thought Billy Donovan had and has to this day is he spends an exorbitant amount of time with his players collectively and individually. And I can't tell you how many times he would tell all of us, but me included, listen, forget the game plan right now. The game plan amounts to nothing. And the out of bounds plays we run is absolutely a zero if we don't know what these guys went through last night and today did they do well in school did they do poorly did their girl break up are they having family issues and he spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the mental was 10 to what the physical was but I will say one other thing at least that always worked for me and I probably was anal about it but preparation uh, I spent way too much time maybe preparing, but I never spoke to our team without practicing it in deep several times, not once, uh, because I think one of the most important things that's asked of me now, looking back, a lot of people will ask, what do you think is the most important thing that a young coach can acquire? Speaking. Uh, there are Rotary Clubs. There's Optimus Clubs. There's all kinds of clubs, Kiwanis Clubs. And the importance of speaking to people and showing how much you care about them. And the one common denominator is you show me any man or woman that opens their mouth and right away they'll tell on themselves that they are either intelligent or unintelligent. And you'll know that quickly. You know, I've been fortunate to have, I think, four or five guys underneath me get another job. And they asked me, what's one thing that's going to be different? And I always told them, you're now that voice every day, <laughs> you know, where you're the assistant. Sometimes right. you're in the back or making a reminder about study table or cafeteria closes, such and such. But and that can be tough when you're on that three or four game losing streak. and You're on an island by yourself. Um, is there a, a, a you know, we're talking a little bit too about habits, but is there an important skill that you would say to people out there that are leaders? Like if you're to have one skill, you know, what would it be? But let me divert for a second because there's books, as we all know, <clears throat> many of us try to read leadership books and there, there should be more books about followers. What's a quality follower? Mm. What isn't a quality follower? Because um, I think like, for example, good to great. There was a time in my generation and in the generation before us where the, the greatest compliment a young lady or a young man could have when they passed away, that was a good woman. That was a yeah. good man. That's escaped us. Now it's only greatness. How many rings do you have? How many championships? How much money do you make? Who's on top? Rather than being good. I always felt like being good is something that's good. I found out in the NBA, for example, which, which I get. It's business, but a third of the teams have to plan on not having success or, if you want to choose correctly, losing. Because in college, the better you do basketball-wise, the better recruit you potentially can get that very next spring. In the NBA, the worse you do, the better player you can get in the spring. So I get it. I understand it. I didn't like it. Yeah, that makes sense. What would you say over your career coaching wise? Like what are some important lessons that 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 you've taken that have impacted you? Well, you hear this a lot generally that 
um, you really can't enjoy success to the ultimate if you haven't gone through something really troublesome. I was a great example of that. It, it's so embarrassing to be fired, period. But if you're an ACC head coach, it, it really is unraveling. And you think the whole world's watching. It was hard for me to get over that. And uh, until probably those, uh, those streamers came down and we won that first national championship sitting with uh, or standing with my wife and three boys, until that time, I'm not sure I did get over it or I might have ever got over it. But I do understand that the tougher times, tougher people strengthen themselves. And we're seeing that in broad daylight now without getting too politically correct here. But honestly, I think that that's one of the most important things. You have to recover, uh, whether it's a loss. You know, we, we go crazy because it's a loss of a game. How about a real loss when we lose somebody we love? And so how do we handle that afterwards? And I think those are the lessons uh, in basketball that we can carry on. And that's why I said earlier, I missed the college game because there's nothing more rewarding on a Saturday or a Sunday that they get a call from Terrell McIntyre or Joe Kim Noah or, 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 or somebody that you coached many years ago, for example. And they're just talking about, about their family or their children or maybe telling an old story to me that's coaching that's what I miss yeah for sure that's great um and now what would you say you know we're talking about teams here you know whether that would be in the sports world business world what, what would you say are um the keys if you will to building a winning team consistently well that's a great question but I, I'm sort of old school and so I, I want I want character first as a, a recruiter. Uh, I, I don't want to take chances if they're chances in terms of character, because we're going to find out there's flaws anywhere. But I'd rather take a chance. Like I remember people saying, well, you're taking a chance on somebody academically. This young man looks like he's unequipped at this point. And I said, you know what? If I know that he and his family want so bad to get educated and they'll, He'll go every single day and try to sap up everything he can do. That's a chance I'll take. I also know that if there's a flaw, if there's a real problem character-wise, if this young man could be a cancer, I want to stay away, even if the talent isn't quite equal. And, and I have some of my best friends that have been able to be very successful coaching low-character, high-talent guys. I don't have that ability. And so – Getting back to your question, I think you have to know who you are. I think you have to know what you can and can't live with and who can you do best with. And then your assistants, or if you're a leader in a corporation, they have to know you and what makes you click so that you can transfer that to your business or transfer that to your ball club. Right, right. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Now, you mentioned, you know, maybe some, some personal, you know, situation with you, but throughout the course of a year, you know, when, when, you're, um, when you're coaching a team, you know, you go through some rough patches. You know, what are some secrets or advice that you would give to people that are going through those right now in the business world or, you know, when we get back and into normalcy, if you will, with, with, with teams? You know, teams are going to go on losing streaks. Teams, you know, guys aren't going to buy in, whatever it might be. You know, what, what's some things that you would give them to, to get through those bad times? Well, I could give you this illustration of something that I did my last three years at Wyoming. Uh, I hope I don't turn anybody off by saying that I was a Bob Knight big fan for many years. I grew up near where he grew up, and I, I, I happened to uh, cross paths several times. I, I, maybe I wasn't uh, on common ground with some of the things that he did, but basically what he stood for. And he wrote a book called The Power of Negative Thinking. And let me just reflect to you. Um, in the spring, when our players came back for eight weeks, I made sure that we spent the first day in front of a board. I had bad handwriting, so I let Larry Nance and Josh Adams take the board. And I said, guys, before we can talk about winning, before we can talk about success, and before we can plan on championships, we have to know what goes into losing. We have to know what a loser looks like, what a loser sounds like, and what a loser acts like. 
And we're going to keep that up for eight weeks, nothing else for eight weeks. And we're going to know it's going to come from you guys. It's going to come from our staff. We all know what a loser looks like, sounds like, and acts like. So we put them on the board. We had each kid say uh, a powder, a guy that goes back and talks behind back, a guy that quits rather than fights, uh, and all kinds of things. We had them on the board for eight weeks. Why are you going to do that? Because we know conflict chaos is going to hit at some time. It's going to either be business-wise, team-wise, or it's going to be individually. Something not going for me or something not going for you. And so I said, when it comes, let's prepare for it. Let's be bigger than it. Let's be able to stop it or at least shut it down the best we can. And then in the fall, when we all came back, we looked at it one more time. It was a reminder. I knew subliminally they knew what was on that board and what was coming possibly in December. And then we began to talk about that championship that, thank goodness, Larry helped us win. Yeah, I love that. That's a great exercise. I'm going to steal that. Did you find in that exercise that when you got into that patch, you could revert back to that and they thought, oh, I'm guilty of this on the board or this on the board? Is that what happened? Well, identifying what I'm weak at or you're weak at or what somebody's weak at is really hard. It's really yeah. a hard thing. But yes, there were some situations. First of all, we lost two in a row. Mm -hmm. There's a situation where we're collectively, we got to overcome this. And then we would remind each other, hey, guys, there's guys in this room. Things aren't going well, even though we've won five in a row. What are you going to do? What are you doing now to help them? Or are you only consumed about yourself? We're finding out every day, it's very visible, whether we're a fan or not, who publicly is worried more about themselves, how they look, how they're coming across, what their numbers are like, rather than worried about others who have it worse than them. You know, and I think you bring up an interesting point right there. Like one thing I've, I struggled with early on in the career as a head coach was the consistency. When we won five in a row, I was in a great mood. And when we lost three in a row, I was in a bad mood. I was a roller coaster, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in leadership positions that are like that. How do you get to that point to where, you know, you are more here and then they, you know, your, your people know more what to expect from you on a consistent basis. Well, that's, that's a great question uh, slash exercise, not easy. And, and, and I would say stay away from trying to be what you're not. Mm -hmm. But I, I'll tell you what I did do at both Clemson and Wyoming, because I was a little spastic sometimes, <laughs> as you well know, I, and I was a loose cannon. So as soon as the game was over, Tim Bray, the SID at Clemson, and then I had a young man who was an intern, but her dear friend at Wyoming, and they had to get me before I saw the team briefly and before I served my press conference or radio show and give me three positives. Because most of the time, Papa Shy didn't see too many positives. And I think if you have somebody that you trust that's around you that isn't faking the funk, but trying mm -hmm. to point out a, a couple of positives, that's important. At least it was for me. Yeah, that's good. And one thing I just want to interject that we did with our team that might be healthy to people is the next day after giving more thought to it, we would involve the guys and do a three good, kind of three bad. And that kind of balanced it out. Hey, there's three areas that we needed to work on, but here's three things that we really did good. And it's just funny how sometimes they wanted to talk more about the bad. But um, so just kind of like wrapping up here, what would you say is one thing you wish you would have known once you started coaching? Is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I think in 1968 and 69, I wish I would have taken typing. <laughs> I never figured out any of this stuff, this social media stuff. Let me, let me leave you with this thought, too, because this is really different. In the last 50, 40, 30, 20, and 10 years, it's changed dramatically. There was nothing more sacred than the locker room. Mm. Soap fights, dirty jokes, yeah, everybody yeah. giggling, sometimes fighting, fist fights, but the one common denominator was there was communication, face-to-face -face communication. And now when you go to a high school, college, or pro locker room, I can tell you exactly it's the same thing on the streets. People looking down, using their thumbs, staring, not talking, headphones, listening to, I want to listen to my followers, my music. Yeah. It's me. 
what's a coach or what's a leader's job? A coach's job is to bring the we, is to put things together. And it's been decimated. And so I, I, I try to remind my sons every day. I say, did you tell mom you loved her today? No, 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 no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It takes the same amount of time. Did you thumb mom you loved her? Or did you tell her? Because there's no body language with your thumbs. And this is something that has escaped us. And I don't know how to grab it back. We don't let her write anymore. We don't do that at all, which is pouring out your emotions. And we don't tell people. We don't talk to people. And we don't listen to people like we once did. And that's made a coach's and a leader's job tougher we have to find ways to do that yeah for sure uh we're going to finish kind of with a rapid fire here but one quick question i'd like to know and, and just interested to hear from other people you know what do you do personally to grow are you you know do you, you mentioned some books already is that how you grow you're talking to others your podcast what, what what is it that that works for you and you found beneficial over time well i never took the time really I, as my wife reminded me all the time you can't do anything but coach because <clears throat> that's all you spend your time doing and so, you know, when I stepped away from the Mavs last July, between July and January of this year, I read 33 books, all nonfiction, which drives her crazy. But I love to read things that are factual, that either happened or we don't want to happen again, or something that's going on right now, or an autobiography. Um, I, I, I spent some time flying to a couple of college programs, met with their themes, staff, watched them practice gave my two cents and helped if I could. And then I had a few staffs over our lake house here in South Carolina. We hit it uh, for eight hours and just Q and A and talk philosophy. And I went to a lot of college games in the area, Asheville, Furman, two really good young coaches and Clemson coach Brownell, a great, a great coach. Um, but, you know, you try to grow. I, I probably haven't done the podcast and the, and the Zooming quite like some of my friends, but uh, this is also a special time for me. I haven't had a chance to see or spend time with my wife for all these years. It's crazy. And so this was a time when, you know, maybe we're getting a little tired of each other at different moments now, but it's a time of giving back. Right, right, for sure. Well, hey, we're going to go somewhat of a rapid fire, but you can take your time if you need to. Three pointers here, and I'm, so I'm going to dish it off to you, and you can shoot some shots here. But number one, if if people could take one thing from this talk, you know, if they could just take something away and hold on to it, what would you want it to be? Do your best and care about others. Love it. Uh, number two, let's say you could have reversed roles. You could have come over here and asked Coach Shy questions. Which question did I not ask you that I should have? What's the most important things in your life and how would you prioritize them? Oh, love it. Love it. And then lastly, we call this good stuff, just something I say and in, 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 in trying to bring to people right now. Is there anything during this time or just in general, can you give us some good stuff for closure here? Well, you know what? I think the things we talked about are healthy because they didn't just talk to basketball or to mm -hmm. coaching. Like, if you're going to be a better teacher, if you're going to be a better businessman, if you're going to be a better political leader, if you're going to be better at anything, you have to do your best. You have to be willing to be good. You have to be willing to fall. But more importantly, you have to have empathy and care about others, or you're just going to be focused on yourself. Yeah, for sure. Well, hey, Coach, I uh, not only appreciate you uh, and, and just what you do and who you are to the core, you know, it's, it's been great in my life. I, a selfish thank you, but I appreciate you coming on the show today and uh, just love staying in touch with you. Um, so thank you so much for, for all of that. Kevin, it's been fun. Hey, look, man, I need a job. <laughs> you know, spread the word, man. And I'll see, we'll see if we can put this out and promote it. But, <laughs> hey, everybody, once again, thanks for joining us. Uh, as Coach just mentioned, so many things in here today that are applicable to your life. So until next time, good stuff.